Well, um, the first thing I would like to say is I don't even know where to begin to address all of the, <laughs> to say, uh, respond to all of the, the things that Bob just uh, talked about. But I will say we're working on all of them. And, uh, but there's one thing that I think is pretty challenging, Bob, and 20 kilometer resolution out of a global magnetospheric model is uh, quite a few years off, and it's not even clear what we're gonna do with all of that data. It's a, it's a lot, lot to deal with. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit different approach uh, than Bob did, but um, I will come back to some of the things that the uh, magnetospheric uh, people need from the IT people in order to, to advance uh, this problem. The first, first thing, though, uh, for people out there who may be wondering why are outflows important in the first place, so I'd just like to say a little bit about that and then, and then go on to some of the other issues. <coughs> um, first of all, how do we view other parts of the geospace system? And other here, the emphasis is if you're, if you're uh, from the magnetosphere, how do you view the ionosphere, et cetera? We, we have this uh, wonderfully complex view of the IT system here, but if you ask many people in the magnetosphere what's important about this system, there's one thing. Tell me what the conductance is. And so this is what the magnetosphere needs in the first order anyway. Um, of course, the magnetosphere has its view of this complex system of geospace. And I remember at a meeting a number of years ago on uh, MI coupling, uh, in response to some questions uh, Tim Colleen uh, received about, well, what about the magnetospheric inputs? And Tim said, you know, we don't really know whether the magnetosphere responds mainly as a capacitor or an inductor yet. And so uh, we can replace the magnetosphere as a simple linear system. And in fact, there's a whole school of thought in the magnetosphere that basically the magnetosphere ionosphere system is a, a linear system uh, uh, filter and uh, to uh, solar wind variability. Now, uh, Ty Fan's going to tell us tomorrow about all of the interesting plasma physics that goes on in the magneto sheath. And uh, the solar wind part of our problem also has its views of interesting complexity. But one thing that the IT and M people can agree on is that if there's one thing we want to know from the solar wind, what's the power? How much energy is coming in? What's the voltage? OK, well, um, it turns out that, you know, and, and this model can be souped up and has been souped up significantly uh, to, in a lump system view. But the mass flow through this system significantly affects, however you want to treat it, significantly affects all of these elements and makes it a very nonlinear system. And then the question is, how important is the effect in geospace dynamics? So um, just to try and encapsulate uh, some of the important uh, things on the impacts of the geospace system of outflows, we know from observations and models, and I would say, and, and maybe this is because I'm coming from a magnetospheric perspective, we know uh, quite a bit about some of the effects of outflows on the magnetospheric part of the system, and maybe I'm just not as prepared to talk about some of the impacts of ionospheric outflows on the IT part of the system, but it may be that maybe more of these things are known from the magnetospheric side. We know that outflows enhance the storm time ring current. They regulate magnetospheric composition, uh, therefore affect uh, uh, electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves and radiation belt dynamics. They modify the magneto tail, plasma sheet dynamics and structure, inflate the magnetosphere, and uh, actually affect, modify the solar wind magnetosphere interaction, uh, and, and thereby uh, change the transpolar potential that's impressed on the uh, ionosphere. Uh, outflow can change the uh, threshold for Kelvin Helmholtz instability at the magnetopause. And uh, what we've learned recently is that outflows can induce periodic substorms of the magnetosphere ionosphere system. From, on the IT side, uh, we see that uh, outflows are associated with topside cavitation of the ionosphere and, and perhaps are the cause of uh, ionospheric cavitation. And, and we see correlations with thermospheric upwelling, although the, the causality is not clear. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So uh, let me uh, illustrate a few of the aspects of outflows that are important. The zeroth order aspect is outflow or no outflow. Okay, we can talk about the properties, but outflow or no outflow. One of the things we found recently is that if you don't include outflows in global magnetospheric simulations, you don't get saw teeth oscillations, periodic substorms in, uh, in those simulations. When you do include outflows for dead steady solar wind conditions, 
the system starts ringing uh, with a period of two, two to five hours. There's, an, there's actually an emission on this uh, in my, my uh, impacts uh, chart here, uh, and, and that's the plasmosphere. Another zeroth order effect of outflows is there's no plasmosphere without outflows. There might be co-rotation, but you're not going to fill the plasmosphere if you don't have outflows. What other aspects of outflows are important? So I'm going to draw on some work from a couple of uh, graduate students, Oliver Brambles and Vin Zhang, uh, in, in, uh, including precipitation, uh, power, uh, electromagnetic power flows and outflows in global simulations. And uh, I'd like you to look at case A and case B here, and I call one conic-like and one polar wind-like, although that nomenclature is not quite precise. But case A is a relatively fast outflow at the lower simulation boundary, uh, relatively energetic at 100 dV, and case B is a relatively uh, slow outflow and cold polar wind-like. And uh, the patterns that you see at 6RE map down to uh, 100 kilometers are shown in the right-hand uh, panels here, and you see that the slower outflow tends to drift over the polar cap further by the time it gets to 6RE compared to the one that's going faster up the field lines. What effects do these have on the system? <coughs> okay, so for the conic-like outflow, what you find is that the outflow tends to miss the nightside reconnection region and doesn't have much of an effect on the global dynamics. The slow outflow, on the other hand, comes right into the middle of the reconnection region on the night side and has a big effect on the, uh, on the system dynamics. The first case, the cross-polar cap potential increases. The second case, cross-polar cap potential decreases. What do we need from the ionosphere thermosphere people here? What we need to know is what are those outflow properties as a you know, function of input parameters because you can see that the outflow parameters are having a very significant effect on the, on the system dynamics. Um, uh, an, another uh, aspect of the, uh, of the impacts is uh, in, in, in the, the properties and so on. So no outflow is a, you see a picture of the, of the proton density uh, image in the equatorial plane in a global simulation without outflow on the left and with outflow on the right. And this is the polar wind-like outflow. And you see that the outflow is significantly changing the, not, not just the ionosphere, magnetosphere, thermosphere interaction, but the solar wind magnetosphere interaction is being modified, and that's because the ring currents enhanced, the magnetosphere inflates, changes the shape of the boundary, changes the external flow around the boundary, uh, and changes the things like the cross-polar cap potential and so on. Um, the outflow source location is also uh, an important factor in determining how the system responds, and uh, some, some work from Robert Wingley uh, in which, uh, in one case, the, the top example uh, he studied uh, substorm response, uh, and in the bottom case, a storm response, and you see that the locations of the outflow and their, their distributions are quite different depending on how the system is activated. And as the previous slide, or one of the previous slides showed, depending on where that outflow emerges from the ionosphere impacts, uh, determines how it impacts uh, the magnetosphere. Okay, what controls outflows? Um, <coughs> so. Uh, one of the things, and we've, we've heard about this in uh, a couple of the, uh, particularly Jeff, uh, Jeff Forbes talked about the uh, uh, TEC, and the, one of the things that we've learned, I think, in, in the last decade uh, and, and, it, and its impacts on outflow is that the convective transport in the ionosphere is very strongly coupled to the vertical transport or the field line transport from the ionosphere. And so you see here a time sequence, hour, one hour snapshots of TEC during a storm interval, and you see the tongue of ionization moving from the uh, mid-latitude dayside ionosphere up to the cusp region, and that, that, out, that, uh, that convective flow of, of dense plasma is actually feeding the, uh, the cusp outflow that emerges uh, during these intervals. Um, we, this, this is actually a result that's very difficult to get, get to from observations, but I'd actually like to think about challenging uh, some people to think about this from a simulation point of view with a causally regulated outflow model, we find that the, um, uh, that the outflow fluence, that is if you integrate the number of ions emerging from the hemisphere per unit second or per unit time per second uh, as a function of uh, solar wind coupling parameter epsilon is defined on the horizontal axis here, 
that there's a very linear relationship, which is kind of an amazing result when you think about it, because there's a lot of processing that goes on between the solar wind and, and the uh, energization processes that uh, cause the uh, ions to leave the ionosphere. What are the effects of the solar wind on, uh, on driving the outflows from the ionosphere thermosphere? Now, if we look at some statistical patterns, we start to get an idea of what some of the causal relations are, but, but, uh, but, but not, not the details of it. So, we, uh, what you see in this plot is the uh, alphanic pointing flux uh, flowing into the ionosphere um, from the polar satellite mapped down to a 100 kilometer reference altitude. Electron number flux measured from the DMSP satellite, and this is broadband electron uh, number flux, uh, which is indicative of energization of electrons by alphane waves, typically. And then in the lower two, uh, two plots, outflow fluence. Um, so in each of those bins, um, the, the unit is number of ions emerging from that local time latitude bin per unit second. And then on the right-hand lower plot, percent that are associated with alphane waves. So what, what you find, typically, is that the outflows um, are correlated with the alphane waves very well on the night side, less so in the cusp region. And yet, uh, we see um, significant outflows in the cusp region, and, and we also see uh, significant electron precipitation. So there seems to be a relationship between the electron precipitation coming into the cusp, as well as the, uh, as the electromagnetic power flows that are causing uh, the, uh, the outflows to emerge. Okay, what don't we understand about outflows? So uh, some, some work, and if we all work hard enough on Bob Strangeway, he might actually publish uh, these plots uh, sometime soon. Um, but you see a plot uh, on the left of the correlation between outflow flux at fast altitudes, four to, uh, two to 4,000 kilometers, versus alphanic pointing flux in a particular bandpass filter. And then on the right, uh, outflow flux as a function of electron number density defined as the ratio of a power of the elect precipitating electron number flux to a precipitating electron energy flux. And so, uh, in blue dots, uh, night side data, red dots, uh, uh, day side data, and you see significant scatter in these plots. This gives you an idea that while we seem to understand something about what's going on here, uh, there's a lot that we really don't understand there are hidden variables. For example, the source population uh, is affecting how much outflow comes, not just the energy, energy that's coming in, which is uh, what the horizontal axis here is, is attempting to capture. Um, and so we, we actually have a lot of work to do here. And, um, you know, coming back to the question, what do we need from the ionosphere thermosphere community? Well, one of the problems is we have to agree on maybe what's the ionosphere thermosphere and what's the magnetosphere. We're in this sort of no man's land region here, where actually both communities need to come together to make progress in understanding uh, the causal relationships uh, between these uh, quantities. Um, Mike Lamone showed this, a version of this plot from uh, Bob Strangeway's 2005 paper, which shows uh, various relationships and pathways leading to ion outflow. And one thing that's important to keep in mind here, I think we all think we understand Joule dissipation, and, and how electron precipitation affects the ionosphere. But in fact, we really have no direct measurements of these processes, it's ba largely based on models and, and theory. And furthermore, while the upper uh, uh, pathways show correlation coefficients derived from the FAST data, correlation does not apply caus causality or causation. As, and as you saw in the previous plot, there's a lot of scatter in the correlation relationships. Uh, finally, let me talk a little bit about thermospheric control of outflows. And the plot you see here is from a, an old paper uh, using the uh, University of Michigan polar wind model, recently revitalized by uh, uh, Alex Glosser. And uh, you see a, a comparison between the neutral oxygen uh, profile between solar minimum and solar maximum and the associated relationship between the outflow flux between solar minimum and solar maximum, and, and the implication here is that the neutral atmosphere at relatively high altitudes, this is above the main collisional part of the, uh, of the neutral atmosphere, uh, is significantly regulating the outflow fluxes that are coming out of the, uh, out of the ionosphere, and yet 
We don't really have, to my, to my understanding anyway, very good measurements of the thermosphere above five, six hundred kilometers, um, and, and yet uh, the, uh, the densities in that region are significantly affecting the outflows. And then a um, uh, plot that was also shown by Jeff Forbes uh, of the uh, mass density difference uh, derived from the CHAMP satellite in the lower right here. And um, the mass density uh, variations are fairly well correlated, or at least they're occurring in the same region where you see a lot of other uh, processes occurring. Joule dissipation occurring in those regions, alphanic uh, pointing fluxes, field line, uh, structured field line currents, ion outflows, and so on. And so if you, if you take this back to the previous slide, the question is, when, when, the, when the thermosphere upwells in these regions, what effect is it having in sort of gating the, uh, the outflow fluxes that, that emerge from these regions? So uh, to uh, close, let me just leave you with the open questions that I see. One is, how are ionospheric O plus outflows energized? How do interplanetary and ITM conditions control those outflows, their distributions and fluxes, and how does the ITM system respond to ionospheric outflows? Thank you. <laughs>